Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutali Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namani Namaste Sarasati Deve Guruvani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Paskatya Desatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Dvaita Gadadha Shri Vasudhi Gaur Vaktavindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jai Shri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhupada, Chaitanya Shri Gaurabha, Jai Shri Prabhupada, Jai Shri Bhakti Shri Maharaj, Jai Today I'm going to talk about something that's I consider extremely special about Bhakti Chiru Maharaj and he shares this quality uh, also with Srila Prabhupada uh, it's a quality a quality that Krishna has that's extremely special everything about Krishna is special but this one is something that not everybody has uh, and uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, verse number 26 to 30, about 40 qualities of Krishna are enumerated. But the third quality caught my attention, and after thinking about it uh, this morning, I want to speak about this. So one of Krishna's qualities is called Shama. Shama is a Sanskrit word, and So, how was it translated? Well, it's, well, I'm sorry, it's not Shama. The Sanskrit word is Daya, Daya. And Daya means intolerance of others' unhappiness. Yes, that's the point. Intolerance of others, of another's unhappiness. And Prabhupada writes in a purport, according to Srila Jiva Goswami, the third quality, intolerance of another's unhappiness, can be subdivided into one, protection of the surrendered souls, and two, well wishes for the devotee. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord states that he wants every soul to surrender unto him only. And he assures everyone that if one does so, he will give protection from the reactions of all sins. Un unsurrendered souls are not devotees of the Lord, and thus there is no particular protection for everyone in general. For the devotees, he has all good wishes. And for those who are actually engaged in loving transcendental service of the Lord, he gives particular attention. He gives direction to such devotees to help them discharge their responsibilities on the path back to Godhead. Okay, now, there's a particular instance that, or, or a, a thing that happened in the past that Prabhupada writes about in one of his letters from the 24th of August, 1972. So, in, in that letter to uh, Madhuvisa and Amoga, who were in uh, Australia, he writes, I have noted the contents 
with some dismay. In other words, he's referring to a letter that they wrote him giving some report of us, things that happened in Australia. And he says, I've noted the contents with some dismay. I do not, I do not like to hear these things, but whatever is done, is done. What you have done is all right. Now go on preaching as you are doing. So far, the presidents are concerned. They should not be abruptly changed in the future. If there is any complaint, they should be first of all, inf uh, it should be first of all informed to me. One thing we should always remember is that our devotees picked up here are accustomed to all these bad habits in their past life. So sometimes they reveal their old characteristics. Instead of rejecting them, it is up to us to rectify them as far as possible. So try to reform, and he names the name of the devotee, uh, his name was uh, Mohanandan. He says, try to reform Mohanandan there. What he will do by coming here. So I guess they were thinking about sending Mohananda to America. Amoga has indicated he has already shaved his Sika and has left everything. Do you think the USA is a magic place? Simply by coming here, he will become reformed? If possible, you can send to the United States but it is better to correct him to the standard point by friendly gestures. We can reject anyone, that is very easy, but to reform him, that requires great skill and tact, and if you can reform him there by kind words and dealings, that is best. When I was there in Sydney, I observed that Mohan Anandan is very, very good boy, and he has great intelligence and talent. Simply, it has become a little bit misguided due to circumstances. Now, you both big leaders in Australia, along with the others, you make a very concerted, concerted attempt to help Mohan Anandan over his difficulties and persuade him to, that everything is all right that I am not angry or displeased in any way. These things will sometimes happen even with the best devotees. And in this way, try and persuade him to become engaged with his previous enthusiasm for becoming once again a great devotee. He is a young boy, so we should not take his actions too seriously. Better to forget the past and try to reform him. His service can be, once again, very much valuable there in Australia. I know he is very, he's a very good boy. Do not drive him away. That will be the discredit to all of you leaders. But if there is great difficulty, he may come and live with me here in Los Angeles for the time being. I have no objection. But he has done very nicely in Sydney up to the present time. So if you can utilize his experience and talents there, that is the best plan. Well, these are amazing words by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, this is a sign of a pure devotee. A pure devotee has genuine compassion for people that are suffering in the material world. And he cannot sit idle and see, just watch them suffer uh, due to ignorance. Therefore, he tries his best to uh, communicate the knowledge of Krishna consciousness by which all the problems of life can be solved. But it's like saving a man who is drowning in the uh, river when the man is screaming for help and is, and is panicked and is struggling to stay uh, afloat and not drown. And when someone goes to save him, 
in his state of, of panic and, and uh, let's say, disturbed consciousness, he may try and fight off the person that's come to save him. Amazing as that sounds, it is sometimes uh, experienced. But the person trying to save him is not discouraged by the, uh, by the resistance of the drowning person. He understands their panicked state of mind and the fact that they're not in the right mind, state of mind. And he overcomes their resistance and forcibly saves them. Later on, obviously, the person will thank their rescuer because uh, they did not reject them in their confused and delusional state of uh, mind due to the circumstances. So this, this is something that's very important and that's why this particular quality of Krishna as enumerated in the, in the Bhagavatam is what I consider something that Prabhupada, that uh, Bhakti Chumaraj imbibed uh, from Srila Prabhupada and practiced it over and over again in his dealings with devotees. That is, that someone who has genuine, let's say, Vaishnava heart, heart of mercy, or a, a person who can shower an ocean of mercy, they do not like to see others suffering. And therefore, they're willing to do everything possible to save a person. And this is called daya, intolerance of another's unhappiness. There is uh, this specific word in Sanskrit. And Prabhupada says that, uh, and the, the main point that I want to uh, to emphasize is, he says, we can reject anyone. That is very easy. But to reform him, that requires great skill and tact. And if you can reform him, then by there, by kind words and dealings, that is best. Kind words and dealings, that is best. So here we see the, uh, the compassionate heart of a pure devotee. Now Bhakti Maharaj was always, let's say, replete or, or always was, was offering kind words and uh, and gentle dealings because he understood that this is the way Srila Prabhupada also treated the devotees. And this requires great self-control to be able to do. One must have a heart of compassion. One must be ready to sacrifice almost everything to help others. When I say almost everything, that means it's up to the level even their, of their own life and, and happiness to satisfy others. Just like uh, when Lord Ramachandra uh, was king in Ayodhya after all the travails that he and Sita Devi went through with Ravana and the, and the battle and so many things happened. He lived in a very austere life, especially after he banished Sita. He did not live a life of luxury. He lived an austere life, but he gave an example of an ideal leader, someone who's willing to sacrifice his own material happiness in order to help the people of the country. As opposed to nowadays, usually people who are big leaders, they sort of bask in opulence and and uh, fame, and they seek adulation or, or praise, and they seek people's votes for getting reelected and so forth. 
but Lord Ramachandra lived uh, like an ascetic, even though he was king of the whole world. And he, although he was separated from his wife, he did not seek the company of other women. And he always remained faithful to his wife. And, but he gave up his own personal happiness of uh, seeing his children grow up in the company of his wife, supportive company of his wife. He gave all that happiness, so-called happiness in, in a normal sense, up in order to be a Ram Raja, an ideal king that the people love because he treats them as a father and he is willing and, and they see that he is completely renounced and only dedicated to managing the kingdom for the welfare of all and that welfare the ultimate welfare is the spiritual welfare of all the people. That's called an Aryan society, a society in which the uh, striving to go back to Godhead is the main goal of all the citizenry and supported 100% by the king and he organizes the society for that particular purpose. It's not organized for economic development. Of course, because people are so pious and the king is so pious, there is natural opulence in the kingdom uh, and so that's the secret to uh, Krishna consciousness and happy life. Living according to the, or following the regulative principles, chanting Hare Krishna, and having one's goal in life to uh, preach Krishna consciousness for the welfare of all people. So this is right, right in the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the first, second, and third verse, this ethos or general theme of the society uh, is, it says, <clears throat> completely rejected all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This, this beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. So this is the, the guiding principle of society that one can solve all the problems of life. One can actually distinguish illu uh, uh, reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Why does it say that? Because the material world is a place of illusory, illusion and delusory activity. For example, it says that the Krishna is, is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen in fire or land seen on water. So when you are driving, let's say, on an as asphalt highway in the summertime, in the distance, you see water. But there's no water on the highway. It's an, an optical illusion due to the heat of the sun and the bending of light. And at the same time, if you're on a boat in the ocean, uh, on the uh, you may see in the distance land, but there's no land there. Again, it's another optical illusion due to uh, the, uh, the sun and a hot day and the water. So this material world is a place 
of illusory representations and um, also it, uh, Bhagavatam says only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes appear factual although they are unreal so uh, things appear factual here but actually they're temporary and at some point they disappear. Therefore, in that sense, they are unreal. They don't have eternal existence. Everything in the material world seems to be temporary. The only thing that's sure in the material world is death. That's 100% sure. Everything else is unsure. Your bank account, your house, your family, your happiness, all these things are unsure. They come and go. But uh, therefore, Matras Parsas to Kontea Sitos Nasuga Dukudaha Agama Payano Nityas Tams to Tixas for Bharata. It said in Bhagavad Gita the material world is actually a place of temporality and things change just like there's summer and winter season. Similarly, there's youth and then there's birth, there's youth, there's middle age, there's old age, and there's, and eventually there's death. So a person has to be dira, one who's not disturbed by these things. Dira means that they understand that they have an eternal soul and their constitutional position is to serve Krishna, the eternal supreme personality of Godhead. There is such a thing as an eternal spiritual world where there are liberated souls living in harmony with Krishna and the material world is a temporary place and it's a temporary place anityam asukam lokam uh, that's full of misery and birth, death, old age, and disease, all these things are miserable. So it's not a place for a gentleman, it's not a place for uh, good people uh, and therefore uh, the Krishna instructs people in two ways. He, he speaks Bhagavad Gita to give everyone genuine knowledge and spiritual elevation and, and he demonstrates the process of liberation from the cycle of birth and death. And secondly, he teaches people uh, who refuse to accept his instructions by suffering. Uh, misery. Misery is actually a message to the living entity that you're making a mistake and your duty in life is to find out what those mistakes are and to correct them. That's real, uh, let's say, that's, that's a sign that one is taking seriously the human form of life. They're trying to find out what mistakes that they have made that have entangled them in the cycle of birth and death and then correct them and get out of it. So, this is not easy. Most people are so bewildered by the material nature that they cannot, they don't even realize they're making mistakes and therefore there's a period of happiness and there's periods of suffering and it's devastating for most people. So, on top of all that, if a person decides to become a devotee and who decides the try and become a devotee. Well, those who are in distress, those who are inquisitive, those who are uh, seeking wealth, and those who are genuinely seeking the truth. So those motives are self-interested motives. They're not pure motives. But when they approach devotees to find out why they're suffering and how they can get out of that suffering condition and and by the answer is always by regulated devotional service or sadhana bhakti and and associating regularly with devotees and above all regularly hearing Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and chanting Hare Krishna then they have a chance to get out but because of such prolonged period of time that all of us have been in the material world in different bodies and and enjoying sense gratification in different ways, it's very difficult to, to, quick, to overnight change this 
uh, nature, uh, the the, the uh, you know we, the the spiritual nature is called swarupa, but the material nature is called virupa. Virupa means not following the regulative principles, not accepting the supremacy of Krishna, and being attracted to sense gratification and uh, illicit activities, uh, gambling and meat eating, intoxication and illicit sex. So that's called virupa. And swarupa, swarupa actually means uh, swarupa satchit ananda rupa, the eternal life of uh, unlimited knowledge and bliss. That's swarupa. So to go from virupa to swarupa is a big, big and often slow process. Uh, so there, there can be mishaps on the way. You know, and, this, and Krishna understands that. Therefore it says in the uh, ninth chapter, uh, 30, 30th verse, Apichet sudara charo bhajantimam ananyabhak sadhur eva samantavya samyak vyavasito hisaha. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he's, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. So, uh, Prabhupada says, when a living entity is conditioned, that's conditioned by the modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, he has two kinds of activities. One is conditional activities under the uh, compulsion of the modes, and the other is constitutional activities, and that is inspired by uh, uh, knowledge and devotion to Krishna. So, he says, as for protecting the body or abiding by the rules of society and state, certainly there are different activities even for the devotees, the connection with the conditional life, and such activities are called conditional. So, we have two sets of rules that, that govern us. One are the rules of society, and the other are the rules of established by Krishna for advancement in spiritual life. So, this, in, in Sanskrit, those rules are called swadharma. Uh, swadharma or swakarma. Uh, these are the activities. There's lower swakarma and higher swakarma. So, lower swakarma would include also this following the rules of society as well as simultaneously following uh, the rules of spiritual life. And the higher swadharma is once one is accustomed to following the rules of spiritual life, one becomes sincerely uh, dedicated to the service of Krishna and no longer engages in any mundane pursuit of material desires and sense gratification. So that's the higher swadharma, pure devotional service. So, uh, it, it, Prabhupada says, besides this, the living entity who is fully conscious of his spiritual nature and is engaged in Krishna consciousness or the devotional service of the Lord has activities which are called transcendental. Such activities are performed in his constitutional position and they are technically called devotional service. Now, in the conditioned state, sometimes devotional service and the conditional service in relation to the body will parallel one another. But then again, sometimes these activities become opposed to one another. As far as possible, a devotee is very cautious so that he does not do anything that could disrupt his wholesome condition. He knows that perfection in his activities depends on his progressive realization of Krishna consciousness. Sometimes, however, it may be that such that a person in Krishna consciousness commits some act which may be taken as most abominable socially or politically, but such a temporary fall down does not disqualify him. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated that if a person falls down but is wholeheartedly engaged in the transcendental service of the Supreme Lord, 
the Lord, being situated within his heart, purifies him and excuses him from that abomination. The material contamination is so strong that even a yogi fully engaged in the service of the Lord sometimes becomes ensnared. But Krishna consciousness is so strong that such an occasional fall down is at once rectified. Therefore, the process of devotional service is always a success. No one should deride a devotee for some accidental fall down from the ideal path. For, as explained in the next verse, such occasional fall downs will be stopped in due course as soon as the devotee is completely situated in Krishna consciousness. So, uh, the practical demonstration of this is this example of uh, the devotee in Australia, Mohananandan, where Prabhupada says, if possible, uh, he says, uh, we can reject anyone. That is very easy. But to reform him, that requires great skill and tact. And if you can reform him there by kind words and dealings, that is best. Ah, kind words and dealings. Sometimes we do experience that there's this, sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, there's this harsh treatment of devotees by uh, other devotees and leaders of the movement. That was not exactly Prabhupada's, uh, let's say, standard. There are examples when Prabhupada did speak harshly, but this was to correct the devotees, and then he could, well, and then he would revert back to uh, that very kind dealings and, and friendly behavior. Uh, and there are examples of that in, in the. Bhakti Sri Maharaj's book, The Ocean of Mercy, that was only for correcting a devotee, and that was not a, let's say, unending litany of harshness. It, it was short-lived in order to make a point uh, and, and then a return to satyam briyat priyam briyat. The, the truth should be spoken in a sweet and uplifting way. Uh, except in in situations where there is some uh, apparata or some very very egregious behavior, and then one can uh, speak with a raised voice or sharply and hard words, uh, not, not not curse words or anything like that, but hard words, just like when Vidura came back to the palace. Uh, of uh, Yudhisthira and Hastinapur to instruct his brother Dhritarashtra to wake him up from a stupor of of sense gratification and and uh, trying to enjoy royal life as uh, uh, under the protection of Yudhisthira and the Pandavas who had killed all his his children. <laughs> so it was a very very awkward position, but. Dhritarashtra was so attached to being the king and living in royal opulence and giving, being given respect, which Yudhisthira gave him and the Pandavas gave him. So Yudhisthira came back and spoke very sharp, hard words to wake him up from his stupor and make him realize that he should leave immediately the palace and go out into the Himalayas with nothing, just wind up his whole material uh, let's say, affairs and get very serious about uh, preparing for death. And that's what he did. That was his good fortune to have such a sincere brother, a younger brother as Vidura, who spoke in such cutting hard words that it woke him up and he became very sober and he decided that he should prepare himself for death and not gloat in the opulence of print of, uh, of uh, palace life and palace intrigues, as there always are. So he, uh, he was fortunate because of the mercy of his brother, who's a pure devotee. So we can reject anyone, that is very easy, but to reform him, that requires great skill and tact. And if you can reform him there by kind words and dealings, that is best. So Prabhupada 
could always see the good in people. And he did not let the bad in people hinder him from making an attempt to save them. That's, that's the whole point. Devotees sometimes are more merciful than the Lord himself. And this is explained in Bhagavad Gita in the third chapter, verse number 29, where it says, men who are ignorant cannot appreciate activities in Krishna consciousness, and therefore, Lord Krishna advises us not to disturb them and simply waste valuable time. But the devotees of the Lord are more kind than the Lord because they understand the purpose of the Lord. Consequently, they undertake all kinds of risks, even to the point of approaching ignorant men to try to engage them in acts of Krishna consciousness, which are absolutely necessary for the human being. Now, my point today is this was a, a defining quality of Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. He was very, let's say, concerned uh, when he would see other devotees suffering. And he sometimes would do everything possible to help them overcome that, those difficult uh, situations. And oftentimes, these were devotees in trouble who were rejected by others, by other devotees or temple presidents or leaders. And, and so this is daya, uh, that is that one is very concerned about the suffering of others and will make very concerted efforts to help them overcome their travails, their troubles. Uh, intolerance of others' unhappiness. That is called daya. And I experienced that. I was in uh, saw a lot of difficulties at one point. And Bhakti Chiru Maharaj, like a father, adopted me and did everything possible to help me overcome those difficulties, which I did, by his kind words and gentle behavior and friendly gestures. Uh, it says, but it is better to correct him to the standard point by friendly gestures. We can reject anyone, that is very easy, that is very easy, but to reform him, that requires great skill and tact, and if you can reform him there by kind words and dealings, that is best. So, it's, you know, people, who decide to come to Krishna consciousness are already rare people, right? Manushyanam, Sahasresu, Kashchitjati, Siddhaya. Very few people out of the millions and millions of people in this world decide to come to Krishna consciousness. And uh, in the beginning and in the preliminary stages of Krishna consciousness, it's possible that people fall down or it's possible that they make mistakes. So, uh, the devotee understands this. Krishna understands this. Therefore, Apichet Sudarachara, you know, he says even if they perform abominable activities, still, if they are willing to continue in devotional service under the guidance of bona fide uh, gurus, uh, they should be forgiven. And, and as long as they continue try, striving, they should be given a chance to rectify and uh, come back to the normal condition of following the rules and regulations and chanting and, and behaving in a proper way. This is the uh, mercy of a pure devotee. One has to be pure in heart to do such a thing. And it's not easy and it's perilous because uh, sometimes people will uh, not listen, but the devotee doesn't give up. So the example is Vidura, he didn't give up on his brother Dhritarashtra, although Dhritarashtra looked like a hopeless case. And after all that suffering that Dhritarashtra and Gandhari went through, seeing all their children killed, seeing all their plans destroyed, or at least 
Dhritarashtra's plan. Uh, Gandhari was a faithful wife who followed her husband even though he was misled by his ambitions and uh, but she always remained faithful to him. She was not an evil person herself but she followed Vedic Dharma by being a loyal wife. And uh, we see that actually Jitarasa did have the compunction and the, uh, the internal, let's say, uh, uh, possibility of correcting himself due to the strong and, let's say, very, very cutting uh, explanation of his reality uh, by Vidura. Vidura cut through all his illusions with his strong words and woke up uh, Dhritarashtra to leave the palace immediately and prepare for death. And Gandhari followed him because she's a faithful wife, just like she followed him throughout his life and in his most important junction where he gave up his attachment to Gandhari, but he did not stop her from following him and uh, and she, as a loyal wife, did follow him into the into the wild areas of the Himalayas, where one by one they died, but completely detached from uh, material world and focused on uh, going back to Godhead. So this quality of Bhakti Chumaraj, I consider one of the most remarkable, amazing qualities that he manifested not only toward me, but toward many people, many devotees that knew him, who were in trouble, and nobody else was going to help them. Uh, but his kindness, his gentle words, his example of a first-class, compassionate Vaishnava helped these devotees in difficulty overcome those difficulties and remain in Krishna consciousness. This is a real devotee. This is an exceptional devotee. This is Bhakti Churu Maharaj. So thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. We can safely say Bhakti Churu Maharaj is very similar to Vidura, who never gave up on his brother, even though his brother was such a misled and uh, twisted, confused, and uh, spiritually blind person. And eventually, Vidura prevailed and saved his brother. And I would say, in many, many cases, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj has prevailed and helped devotees in difficulty. One example are uh, the members of the congregation that were exiled or thrown out of the temple in, in uh, Brooklyn. And he championed them. He gave them hope. He fought for them. And... He was able to open up that temple so that all those devotees could come back and continue in Krishna consciousness. And he always was compassionate to the people who were errant, but firm. And even though some of those people never really uh, wanted to correct themselves or understand his mercy, he still it was never uh, full of any animosity toward them, and the door is always open to reconciliation. That is Bhakti Chiru Maharaj, a real paradigm of compassion, empathy, and Vaishnava, uh, superlative Vaishnava behavior. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you, and we'll end there. Howdy, Paul.